fantastic introduction. <laughs> um, okay. So this is my second talk here in three days, which is interesting and fun. <laughs> so um, let me just give you a brief introduction about this second talk. Um, I think I see enough new faces to have to introduce some things again. So I try to keep a nice balance between not annoying those who have attended my first uh, talk and this one. Um, so the, the title of my previous talk was, this is why it is in gray, uh, Visual Analytics Building the Science of Analytical Reasoning Facilitated by Visual Interfaces Together. Uh, Today I tried to take a slightly different angle and I thought I could try a little bit more hilarious kind of title and decided to use on two deadly sins of visual analytics. <laughs> and I will explain to you in a moment what I mean. Um, I don't know if I have to say anything more about my, myself, I think my writer said almost everything that you might be interested in. So I will start by giving a very broad overview of, what, of what's my research, what I've been doing in the past, and then of course, for the purpose of my talk, I will have to focus on a few of these things, okay? Um, so basically, my research is around three main islands. The first one is visualization scalability, where basically I try to make visualization more scalable according to different, dimen different directions, different factors. So, um, the first one is the idea of reducing clutter in, visual, in, in information visualization when you have too many objects to represent on the screen and we have a whole bunch of sampling techniques and ways to measure clutter and so on. Uh, the second one is high dimensional data which is basically the orthogonal problem. Instead of having too many objects, now we have too many dimensions to describe this object. And the last one is about having dynamic data and how to have visualizations that adapt um, to the two incoming streams of data. The second island is more about evaluation, and I will say a lot more during this talk about evaluation, but basically the idea is how do we evaluate visual analytics. And then I have a whole bunch of applications, and I have been working in three main areas. I've been working in network security in collaboration with a company in Switzerland, basically on the visualization of um, uh, alarms coming from, a, uh, from an intrusion detection system, trying to help them understand how this engine works. Um, then I have a collaboration on what is called temporal flow maps, which is basically people or groups moving from one region of the world to another region and trying to understand how these movements change in time. And this was in collaboration with uh, the United Nations for a, for a while. And then when I moved in Constance, I had a um, um, very interesting collaboration with a group of biochemists there, where basically the idea is to help them visualize the results of high throughput screening experiments, where they want to understand how a single biological target behaves when it, it reacts with a very large number of molecules. So they want to understand what's the relationship between the activity level of these molecules and the structure of these molecules, okay? So for the purpose of this talk, I will focus mainly on this area here, high dimensional data analysis, scalability, and evaluation. Unfortunately, I don't have time to show you more applications here, but if you, have, if you are curious and you have many other questions, you can of course ask me after the talk or contact me after once I am back home. And I have demos, I have demos on my webpage so you can see them. I have I think I have videos for all of them, so you can at least watch a uh, movie, okay? So let's go to the visual analytics. This is, this is the traditional definition of visual analytics. I don't want to be tedious here. I will repeat it for reference. It's the science of analytical reasoning facilitated by interactive visual interfaces. The idea is to have a visual representation of abstract data and uh, basically trying to use visualization to support the old pipeline. So gathering the data, reprocessing the data, extracting some patterns out of it, visualizing the data, then helping them supporting the reasoning process, and maybe even supporting the dissemination and presentation phase, okay? So it's a whole bunch of uh, uh, steps that we want to support here. So now let's go to the deadly scenes. 
So the idea of two deadly sins come from the fact that I always, I always get, got, get asked these two questions. So visual analytics skeptics ask always these two things. The first one is why don't you solve it automatically? You have a problem with data analysis, why don't you come up with an algorithm and solve it? And that's very common. And the second one is how do you evaluate visual analytics? You have these colored dots on the screen, and now how can, you, how can you tell that this is better than this? And I think these are very valid questions that we have to answer if we want to make this discipline a solid discipline. So basically, my research revolves around these two questions. So let's start with the first one, how to integrate automation and visualization. Uh, let me start by saying that I think that some problems do need a visual analytics <coughs> approach. They cannot be so re readily as, uh, solved by using exclusively uh, automatic algorithms. The problem is that either in some cases the problem is not well understood yet to come up with a solution, and in this case visualization can help understanding the problem better and maybe come up with an idea to solve it automatically. The second case is, is trickier, is the fact I truly believe that there are cases where the domain knowledge is needed and there is no way to solve the problem completely in, a, in an automatic fashion. And I have had several experiences myself that, that makes me believe that this is true. The second point is that we have visual analytics, of course, also when visualization does not scale. So on the other side, we need to apply some kind of automatic algorithms to either reduce the data first or extract some meaningful patterns out of it because it doesn't make sense to visualize the raw data as it comes. And of course, there are a number of examples that I collected here, like understanding how computer viruses change. We have an interesting project in Constance with uh, Symantec, and they have no idea how to deal with new viruses. Um, understand bird migrations in space and time. Again, we have a very nice project with this biology, ornithologist. Um, as I said, understand relationship, relationships between molecular structure and activity, or understand how distrib distributed algorithm behave. There is a very long list. Um, so here I have a golden rule of visual analytics. So the golden rule is don't use visual analytics if you can do it automatically. So I think that. When you come up with a new idea and you think about it, you should, stay, you, should think, you should first ask yourself, can I solve it with an algorithm? And if I can't, then visual analytics is really valuable. So um, since I think this is an interesting and important area of research, a couple of years ago, I started with this idea and I said, but let's see what people have been, done, have been doing so far in this area. So what I did was a, a survey that is called Investigating and Reflecting on the Integration of Automatic Data Analysis and Visualization in Knowledge Discovery, it's a bit long, which was published in the CKDD Explorations Journal. And basically what we did here was to collect a quite large number of papers. We went through the old set of KDD papers, ICDM papers, and Infobis papers. It was too early to have bus papers there as well, so we, we, we only collected these ones. And we extracted, we extracted those papers where there was some source of integration between data mining and uh, visualization. And of course, as you can see, the, the subset is very small. This is the complete set, the old set of proceedings from these conferences. And now we started reasoning, okay, what kind of integration we see here? Can we classify these integrations in a way that we can better understand what's going on there? And we basically came up, came up with three classes, which we called the uh, B++, which stands for Visualization++, plus plus, Mining++, plus plus, and Visualization and Mining integrated together. So let me give you a little bit more details about that. So the first one was, was called Computationally Enhanced Visualization, and there were examples like creating complex projections or having, having intelligent data reduction before having visualization itself, or pattern disclosure. The idea is that you have a visualization, but then you have an algorithm that helps you um, uh, find interesting elements into this visualization automatically. And I will, I will show you one of my works in this direction. And then the second one is the opposite. I have a data mining algorithm and now I want to enhance it with, with visualization. And here we have stuff like model presentation. You can think, for instance, if you have a, a neural, neural network or a classification model and now you want to visualize it in order to, in order to understand how it works 
or in some other cases you have more complex patterns like clusters, rule, or stuff like that. And then we also noticed in a very, very few cases, set of cases, solutions that are so well integrated that you cannot really tell whether it's mining that is helping visualization or visualization that is helping mining. They are very, very integrated. And we call it integrated visualization and mining. And white box and integration and black box integration depends on the level of integration of the tool. Okay, so here is our first example that comes from comes from my own research that covers one of these one of these uh, classes. So here the idea is to um, use some kind of algorithm to enhance the visualization. So in what area? In the area of high dimensional data visualization, we have the problem of how do we visualize uh, data that comes from tables that have many, many dimensions. This is a common problem. So for instance, if we take the scatter plot matrix, which is a st very standard representation in visualization, if we have four dimensions, <coughs> it works pretty well. If we have 20 dimensions, it starts being a little bit harder to understand, right? If we have 100 dimensions, we cannot see anything there. And 100 dimensions today is not too rare, right? So the question here is, we have a standard visualization technique. Now, now can we use some sort of algorithm to make this visualization more understandable or useful? So we came up with this idea of using quality metrics to find interesting projections, and we started with a simple idea. We did pairs of column, every possible pair of columns from the table and create a scatter plot out of these two dimensions. So this is a very, very simple scatter plot. It's not a dimensional reduction kind of scatter plot. It's just two dimensions. We do the same for every, for every pair of objects. And now we want to measure some, for every, for every scatter plot, how interesting it is. So the first question is, how can we measure the interestingness of a, of a projection? And the second one is, does it correlate with human perception? So in the first case, we have a number of metrics that try to work on classified data. And basically, try to find those projections in which the, the, the objects are well separated in the projection. Okay? And we have a number of metrics like this one. I'm not going to show you all of them, but this one is, is called class density, which uh, takes three steps. Basically, we have the initial scatter plot is uh, split into three scatter plots, one for every, for every class. In this case, we have three classes. Then it is translated into a density field on the screen. And now, for every single pixel on the screen, we have a density function that tells what's the density around this pixel. And now we compare every pair of scatter plot here, and we see what's the difference in density for every single pixel. So the higher the difference, the better the metrics, because it means that they are well separated. Then I give you another example of, of quality metric. This one is more based on um, entropy. The idea is to have um, a bar chart on top of each scatter plot that um, keep track of how many points of each class falls in each scatter plot. And now for each bar, we calculate the entropy value, and then we sum up this value to have, to have a number. Now the problem is that by rotating this scatter plot, you can have different values. And now what we do, we try, we rotate it, and we have enough steps to find the maximum, and once we have the maximum, the maximum is the value of the metric. So now we came up with the idea, okay, we have these nice measures, but do the measures correlate with what a human would do if a person would be able to go through all these set of scatter plots, would they select exactly the same, the same scatter plots that are selected by the algorithm? Okay, so we, we ran a, a little study to investigate this issue where we used a simple data set that is called Wine data set with 178 samples, 13 attributes, 3 classes, and we have a whole bunch of metrics that come from from different uh, sources, different uh, papers, uh, 18 undergraduate students from uh, natural science, these capture plots, and the question was select projections which are suited to classify the three types of wine. And now at the end we have 
interesting correlations between the every single uh, metric and what the user selected. So here is user classification, and here is the is the value of the metric. Every single dot here is one scatter plot, and as you can see, there are different degrees of correlation. And these two ones actually are the ones that score uh, best among, among among the old set. And one thing that we learned from this study is that actually the the quality of these metrics depends very much on both how well separated these classes are, but also the density. And since every single measure here focuses either on density or class separation, we have the feeling that if we could come up with something that mixes the two, the, 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 the measures could actually even improve more than that. And another drawback of this study is the fact that we didn't, we didn't really expect any strange shape. Here the clusters their shape is quite roundish, okay? We could, of course, have tried something that is a little bit more complicated than that. It's a first step. But is it, was there an a priori understanding of what the classification should be? I mean, you can the, compare, you compare the, cluster, the clustering versus the human, but yeah. you could also have that it was based upon labeling. And so you'd already decided a priori that there existed three clusters in the data based upon wine type or grape type. This is the way it is. This is the way the, the color represents the, the wine type. Is it clear? Okay. Okay. This leads me to the, the second technique that I want to show you, which is basically covers another another class from my initial model that I've shown to you, the, the survey about integration of visualization and mining. Here we have the opposite case. We have a mining technique and we want to use visualization to, to, to understand the output. So here we are in the area of subspace analysis. This is a project in collaboration with Professor Seidel at the University of Aachen. He's an expert, one of the leading experts in subspace clustering. And we have a project funded together on that from the Swiss German Foundation. And what is subspace analysis? Well, the basic intuition here, again, we are in the area of high dimensional data analysis. And the problem is that it's a very well known fact that once you have a very high dimensional data set, then the, the distances between the points in this data set starts being completely meaningless because all the distances are basically the same. Okay? So the idea of subspace clustering is why don't we try to find cluster in sub clusters in subsets of dimensions? Of course, if you start thinking about it, this is a huge problem because if you take every possible combination of dimensions, the search space is really, really huge. So what this uh, area of data mining is trying to do is to have some clever algorithms and heuristics to find, to explore this huge space and come up with interesting subspace clusters, okay? Um, another aspect of this idea, which I, I think it's really intriguing, is the fact that as, we, as soon as we try to find clusters in different subsets of dimensions, we come into the area of what they call alternative clusterings, which basically means that, think about it, if we find interesting clusterings with different sets of dimensions, it is possible that there we are capturing different concepts existing in the database, right? So this is a toy example, just to let you understand what I mean. So here we have exactly the same database, but different pairs of, of dimensions. So this would be one, subspace and this would be another subspace, okay? And the points are exactly the same objects. So here we have average consumption of fruit and average sportive activity. And here we have a cluster of empty people and a cluster of unhealthy people and some noise in between. Now we project exactly the same point on another space and we have people who attend classic concerts and people who attend rock concerts and we have these nice clusters like Love Rock, Love's Classic, and prefers other music. And as you can see, those people who were very well clustered here, they are scattered around other clusters. So in both spaces we have clusters, but they group the objects in completely different ways. So they are basically capturing different meanings there. Okay, and there are very nice applications of this kind of stuff in microarray data analysis to find, for instance, genes that have different functions or customer segmentation, or even in image processing. 
Now, that looks really nice. Oh, sorry. Uh, when you talk about high dimensionality, how does this relate to the uh, sample size? The Are sample size? Yes. Number of the point. object? Number of points. Number of Number points? Of points? Yeah. Uh, does, it really, does it relate much? Uh, well, of course it affects the algorithm because some of these algorithms have to, for instance, I, I'll give you a simple, a simple example. Some of these algorithms first search for the, for the subspaces and then they cluster the subspaces. And the clustering phase is dependent on the number of objects. So, in terms of performance, it, it is affected. But the old, is it clear? I think, uh, what, you mean is, I think what you mean is... The, but there's a the fundamental direct, issue of all your statements. Is dimensionality is extremely related to the sample size. A five dimensional data size with three samples is extremely high dimensional. A hundred dimensional data size with 10 million samples is a very low dimensional data set. Well, the, 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 the dimensions. Sure I agree. What is that? <laughs> In this, the dimensions are the number of categories that he's using at each point, right? Yeah. So the number of people. So that's set. And then there's the question of how many samples out of that dimension. Right. Yeah, but the fundamental about the relationship. The relationship between, between right. how, how many, but how many, so how many in these examples, right, right now we know that you have at least, what, health, you have health, you have 100, 100, 100, 100 points, but how many dimensions do you have? Yeah. How many categories? Okay, so for each point there's a tuple, or there's an n-tuple. What's the, what's the dimension of the n-tuple of the number of categories? That it's very high. High. But, That's the point. Well, but what, how, what is it? Thousands? Tens? Yeah, that, it's the relationship. Hundreds. 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 So it's greater than the sample size or less than the sample size. That's the important thing. Right. Yeah. It, I think they, they don't distinguish between the two. As far it's as I know. It's a very it's important very distinction. Okay. Yeah. Just think about the co covariance. One gives you uh, well-defined covariance. The other one gives you degenerate covariance. So... It's very easy to come up but with. I'm the, pretty sure that the way these algorithms work, uh, they are not fundament fundamentally affected by that. They yeah, are affected in terms of efficiency, but the model doesn't change, I'm, I'm sure. That I find extremely hard to believe. Okay, yeah. yeah. We can discuss more. Anyway, so I think this is nice. We have this whole bunch of algorithms, and they have been developing algorithms for almost 20 years now. But now, the problem is that interpreting the output of this algorithm is really hard. I'll, I'll try to give you an example of how it works. So the kind of output of this subspace clustering algorithm is something like that. So it's like little islands in the in the space of in the table in the in the data table space. So it's basically a subset of objects and a subset of dimensions. <coughs> now understanding these kind of clusters is really hard because this is one single cluster. And relating this cluster to another cluster is really hard because another cluster exists in a completely different space and these spaces can also overlap but only for a few dimensions. So we came up with the idea together with them of trying to come up with some visualizations that help understanding this output and we have a whole pipeline that tries to, to address several problems at the same time. So we, we have a first phase that tries to extract, instead of clusters, tries to extract directly subspaces. And we use an algorithm that is called surfing there. Then, the problem is that we still have a lot of redundancy, and the, the, the size of the output is still quite high. So we have a phase that is called subspace grouping, where we try to reduce the redund this redundancy in a controlled manner. I'm going to explain more. And then we have the visualization phase that tries to visualize the, the result. So let's start from the first uh, first step. This is subspace search. So the idea of subspace search is that so if, if this is the, the search space and every level is the dimensionality of the subspace that is searched at that level, so here we have all the one-dimensional subspaces, two-dimensional subspaces, three-dimensional subspaces. This uh, what this algorithm does is basically trying to visit this uh, lattice and have a rule to say, at this level, I will keep only a subset of these subspaces and I will expand only over these subspaces from this point on, okay? They have all sorts of heuristics to do that. Once we have that, we have, as I said, we still have a quite large number of subspaces, plus these subspaces might be highly redundant. So what we do here, we have to come up with a, with a way to calculate the similarity of subspaces. 
And we have two ways to calculate the similarities. One is in the dimension space and one is in the object space. So basically in the dimension space we calculate how many shared dimensions are there, which is pretty easy. And in the second case we have to find similarity in terms of the topology. And we, we tried a whole bunch of techniques and we came up with the, we, we found that the best one was using a KNN um, uh, approach. What we do there, basically we sample the subspaces and we, for every, uh, for all the points that we have sampled, we look at the, at the nearest neighbors and then we see how much overlap there is between these nearest, nearest neighbors. Now, what is nice about these two different ways of looking at similarity is that we can have four cases here. We can have that for any given pair of subspaces, these subspaces can be similar in terms of dimensions but not in terms of typology or similar in, in both or all, all the four cases. So in case they are similar in terms of topology and, and, in term, and in terms of dimensions, we have a truly redundant subspace because they are similar in both, in both spaces. In the second case, we have the, dim the, the dimensions are not similar, but the topology is similar. It means that even if the dimensions are different, these are leading to the same kind of clustering, which means basically that these two subspaces could be merged and basically come up with the same kind of cluster. Then we have a very interesting case where the topology is not similar, but the dimensions are similar. So we have similar dimension sets, but for the few dimensions in which they are different, these lead to very different clusters. And this means that there we have what we call dominant dimensions. It means that this little difference there is, is making a huge difference because it's creating a new, a completely new kind of topology. And then we have the last one that is truly complementary. They are not similar in terms of dimensions, they are not similar in terms of topology, and these are truly alternative cluster, clusterings, which are the interesting part of this work. Then, as I said, we want, once we have these similarity values, we aggregate the subspaces in a way that the user can interactively choose what's the level of redundancy that he wants to keep in the visualization. Um, so let me show you what we have here. This is, uh, this is the interface that we have. So basically we have a number of windows. I'm going to explain to you every window what, what it represents. So every single, so this whole uh, system is based on the idea that every subspace is represented by a scatter plot, and the scatter plot is uh, the result of projecting this data in the subspace, okay? So this is created, every single scatter plot is created by projecting the data using only the dimensions that pertain to the, to the subspace. Now what you see here in this window, these are every single, either, every single scatter plot represents a cluster of subspaces and, and this is the representative of the, cl of the, of the cluster, of, of, the old set, um, of the old elements in the cluster. Here, what you see here is actually the elements that are within every single cluster. So here are all the elements that are within this cluster, here all the elements that are here, and so on. And as you can see, there is a lot of redundancy. So these are all the subspaces that have been generated by the algorithm itself. Now what we can do is this. We have that the clustering can be, the clustering of the subspaces can be created according to one type of similarity. And the projection of the subspaces is created according to the other type of similarity. So I'll try to be clear about that. So here, the, for instance, the clusters are generated according to the similarity in terms of topology. And here, the subspaces are laid out according to their similarity in terms of the dimensions they share. And this is really nice because now we can see in which part of the projection we have elements. So what you expect is that the similarity in terms of dimensions is correlated to the similarity in terms of typology, but where this doesn't, doesn't happen, you have interesting cases like this one. So this means that we have subspaces that are similar in terms of dimension, but they create completely different typologies. The topologies, you see here, we have completely different clusters. So this example come, comes from a synthetic data set, and then we, 
we tried with some real world data. Let me show you. This is data coming from a food database where they have lots of dimensions describing every single food in a, in a, in a very large database. And again, as you can see here, we have interesting projections. And one projection is the elements of one projection are colored in a way that every cluster is colored according is, is, is colored with a different color. And as you can see, in some of the projections, these colors are, are maintained, but in other projections, they are completely scattered all over around. So this means that here we have subspaces which actually represent completely different concepts. Okay? And this is again the food data where we see exactly the same behavior with a different color. Okay, this concludes my part about integration of. Yeah, sure. Are the subspaces always aligned with the um, input axes or could they be rotated? Um, we have only orthogonal projections here. We are taking into account only the. the so every subspace <coughs> is made out of the original yeah, dimensions. Yeah, so, so. This, is, this is on purpose because we want to be able to facilitate the, the understanding yeah. of the yeah. It's very easy to understand yeah. what's your the original dimensions there. Of course, there are all sorts of limitations because of that as well. But yeah. Um, do you have any other questions before I move on to the next? Yeah, please. Um, I was wondering how you dealt with the um, with the noise that's inherent um, in the data. Um, so, for instance, going back to the question of um, dimensions or some data points you have, do you worry about having some dimension which clusters the data in a completely different way than all the other ones? And do you trust this less because it may have occurred just because of chance of what your sample is from some much larger underlying data set? Or do you... Um, you mean that the sample that I have is not representative for the old... For the old um, th 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 this is, should probably always be, you know, some consideration. Right? Um, th 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 I must say that I never thought about it. <laughs> okay. Well, well, maybe I follow up. So, yeah, I mean, what, what's the interpretability of uniqueness of projections? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or how does one make sense of that? I, mean, that, I think that's sort of what I'm not sure I understand. So you said, okay, we can look at this and we see some projections that are very unique in terms of the problem. Yeah. Others are very similar to other projections. <coughs> okay. What would one make of that in trying to evaluate this information? Would one say that the unique projections are themselves quite interesting? Or would you rather say, no, they're somehow artifacts of my data set because they're not consistent across other projections? How, how does one... I mean, How does one kind of digest all this? I mean, the, the, main, the main objective here is to help people uh, deal with this first step of finding projections which might be alternative views in the data. Okay? So the problem is that the output generated by this algorithm is so large and redundant that even just having a tool that helps you understanding where this alternatives are, and if they, if they are real alternatives, is already a big improvement. Consider that there are almost no tools that visualize this kind of data. So for them, the, I am collaborating directly with these people who are, who are creating these algorithms, and for them it's really, really, really useful to see that. So of course, I, I, I am sure that there is a lot of, not necessarily all these subspaces in which we see different topologies are meaningful. But if there are meaningful uh, subspaces, you would detect them there. Because now the problem is reduced from a very large problem to a problem that is manageable. A lot more manageable. Did I answer? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, maybe another way to get at this question would be, mm -hmm. are there cases where you know of where they looked at this, this visualization and it has influenced their thinking? then we can understand how they're using this, this visualization. So, so have they been, if you have examples of, oh, they looked at this, they saw this, and as a result, they now do this other thing? No, not yet, because this is a project that we just started. So what I'm presenting here is a very early exploration of the problem. But what I know is that their initial feedback is, wow, finally we can really understand what's going on here, and they might have additional ideas on how to create new algorithms. So I know for sure that one 
one common problem for them is exactly this redundancy problem, and they want to they want to resolve it automatically. And adding a way to see this problem visually is helping them a lot. But consider <coughs> that this project started <coughs> six months ago, so it, it will take some time. Yeah. So if I understood, and related to Ross's earlier question, if I understood what you just said previously correctly, you said if a feature exists and it may be meaningful, <coughs> that you may see a feature that exists and you may postulate that it's meaningful, but it may not be. However, you asserted that this visualization will make sure to contain all meaningful things. Yeah. Now back to Ross's question. How do you know that? First of all, how do you know that? Second of all, you've assumed that all meaningful things are represented on the coordinate in the dimensions represented by the particular uh, coordinate system that you have. And you said you were limited to that coordinate system. Yeah. So there yeah. may be meaningful things in different coordinate systems yeah. that are not yeah. represented. Absolutely. So, so I will answer first, first to, the, to the first one. So the first one, how do we know it? So our initial experiments are, we have been doing some experiments on artificial data. So what if, what I've shown here is artificial data. So we know where the alternative cluster, clusterings are here because we created this artificial data. And we know that the groupings that we see here are the right groupings, groupings that we want to see. So in this sense, we evaluated the, the tool in this way with artificial data, okay? The second question that you asked me is, the answer is, of course, I think, of course, there are there might be interesting interesting uh, uh, patterns in in non-orthogonal subspaces. Um, as far as I understand, in the area of subspace clustering, there has been a very very large body of research on focusing only on orthogonal subspaces, and uh, the problem is hard enough to keep doing to keep doing uh, research in this direction. So I think in the future they, they will want to do that, but it's not advanced enough to go into this direction. At least this is my, my, my understanding of the problem. Yeah. Just to clarify, there's a very big difference between orthogonal subspaces and cardinal subspaces. Don't interchange those two terms. You're focusing on cardinal subspaces, which is just given by the original axis align. Cardinals which, cardinals which are orthogonal. Right. Yeah. 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 The way you define your metric. Right. Uh, yeah. But orthogonal, arbitrarily oriented, is a whole different. Right. Yeah, so I think Ross's question originally was with respect to non cardinal. Right. right. But possibly orthogonal. Ross, I see this limiting. Yeah. There's nobody get up to this. So the trick has to be in the data. I mean, the subspace that case. That would be one way of trying to get at that. Okay, I'd like to Can see I? the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> this brings me to the to the second part of my talk about visual analytics evaluation. So how to evaluate visual analytics? This was the second key question. So when is a visual analytics solution better than another? Under what circumstances and why? How can we systematically explore a solution in order to, to check whether it works or not? I think these are very valid questions that we have to answer. And I think that if we don't answer these questions, visual analytics is, is basically like playing darts. Because you have some data, you can represent this data any way you want, and then if you don't have a way to say this is better than this, or this actually achieves the goal that I had at the beginning, we have a big problem here and we cannot be taken seriously. <coughs> but at the same time, I have to say that it's hard, it's really hard. So why is it hard? First, because it cannot be evaluated automatically so far, because there is a human in the loop and because the metrics are not very well defined. The second point is that visualizations are very complex artifacts. There is a visual representation and interaction normally together. And then the performance doesn't depend only on the representation, but it depends on the data, the tasks, the users, the environment, and a lot of additional parameters. Plus, the tasks are not well defined. So if you want to evaluate visual analytics in terms of discovery, learning, decision making, what kind of tasks do you have there? It's, it's, it's a little bit fuzzy. 
So what, what we have been using in the community for quite many years so far is controlled experiments with benchmark tasks. So I'm going to explain for a moment what it is and why I think it's not the, exactly the best way to, to, to evaluate visualization, or at least it's not good enough. So this is an example that comes from one of my recent, recent studies. Here what we try to do is to evaluate alternative belief designs for for temporal data. So here we have the traditional line. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say something else. We want to see, we, we have been applying this, we have had this problem in, uh, in network security where we want to see the development of many, many different sources from a, from a given network at the same time. So this means that every single timeline is very small on the screen, okay? So now we came up. We came up with um, in one of these in one of these techniques. Uh, sorry, in one of these solutions, we came up with a circular glyph to represent this data for a number of reasons because it, it's similar to a clock. So we conjectured that it would be easier to understand this data with a clock. And then we started asking, but okay, but what about other possible designs? So we came up with different four different designs. Basically, two linear designs and two circular, and two that use position or length, and two that use color as encoding techniques, okay? Another question is, which one is better? And it's always the case in visualization when you want to evaluate single components, you ask which, which one is better. Okay, if you want to answer that, you have to come up with some tasks. What's the task here? Okay, we came up with some tasks. Peak detection, what's the, where is the peak? So you ask to the user, where is the peak here? And of course you need data, you need synthetic data for doing that. Then, but is it peak enough? No, I don't think so. So, trend. Is it an increasing trend or a decreasing trend? And if I have a, a trend that increases very fast, can I distinguish from a trend that increases less fast, faster, right? Which leaf design is better? It's not clear. And now we have all sorts of patterns, very strange kind of patterns. Can people find these patterns? So we have these questions. Okay, we arranged our controlled experiments, probably done with lots of statistics and stuff that I'm not going to mention. Bar graphs everywhere. This is only for peak detection. <laughs> this is only accuracy, and this is completion time. You want to measure how much time it takes to run the task and how many errors you made there. And this is the result. We have peak detection, line is better here. Peak detection, time comparison is another variation. Clock is better here, but line is better here for efficiency. Pattern detection, line here, but star here. Trend detection here. And not all of these differences are statistically, statistically significant. So what can we conclude here? And this, um, I've been doing this kind of studies for a while, and quite often the result is something like that. And now you have to come up with a generalizable solution that is not generalizable, okay? It's really hard to come up with. Plus, even if it is, this is very much related to the tasks that you came up with, which is not necessarily exactly the same task that people would use there. It's very much related, dependent on the data that you used, and so on. Okay, so in order to address this kind of uh, problems, I, I, um, Created together with a, with a, with some colleagues, a workshop that is called Believe started in 2006. We have it every two years, and we discuss exactly these kind of issues. How can we make it better? Can we come up with the methodologies that are a little bit better than that? And it's interesting. Starting from 2006 up to today, we are going to have a new one this year. We have been creating in the community new methodologies, not perfect, but at least we have new new things coming up. We also uh, edited an, an, um, an issue on evaluation information visualization in the information visualization journal. And um, from starting from one of the, I think, yeah, the, the last belief, some of us started thinking about why don't we try to analyze all the existing evaluation techniques that we can find in the community and maybe suggest uh, some, let's see if there are any interesting trends there and maybe we can also suggest uh, potential interesting directions for the future. So we have been analyzing 850 papers from all these venues and we isolated those that contain some form of, of evaluation 
And then we created uh, what we call seven scenarios for evaluation, which are split into two categories. The first one is more about evaluating, evaluating performance, experience, algorithms. So it's more related to the visualization itself. And these other ones are more related to the process. And as you can see, there is a quite interesting increase of evaluations in visualization overall. But especially in, the, in these areas that are more related to the visualization, but a lot less in the process. And please consider that in the process we have stuff like evaluating visual data analysis and reasoning. So try to evaluate in terms of what kind of information are people extracting from the tools when they use them, which is exactly what we, we do care about, right? We want to see whether people can really extract some information out of it and not whether it's faster or less error or whatever, because we don't know if there is a correlation between these two things. So one example, again, comes from my own research. This is a very recent uh, uh, study published at the next Eurobase. Um, here we have Flow Maps, one of the projects that I've been dealing with in, uh, in Switzerland. And when you have temporal flow maps, the two traditional and simple solutions to deal with the fact that there is time there is either to animate the result or to use a small multiple representation where every single tile here is one point in time. So basically you are trading off time with, with space here. So now we wanted to understand how these two alternative <coughs> solutions uh, perform and we didn't want to to do it the traditional way, the same way I explained to you before. Coming up with a number of tasks, measuring this task and so on. So we started saying, how can we use a methodology that tries to capture what people actually extract by these visualizations by using them? So we came up with a, an open-ended protocol where basically what the participants do, they are instructed to search for findings, any kind of finding, and we have this instrumented tool where they can type the findings directly on the tool. Then we collect findings in, so in forms of nodes. And then there is a group that starts with interface A and then switch to B and the other group the other way around. And then what the researchers do, they have to go through a quite lengthy phase where they code the findings. The idea here is that at the beginning of the study, I don't know exactly how to classify these findings into some sort of categories. So we draw, we use a technique that comes from, uh, from social science that is called axial coding, which basically is a technique that helps you, starting from raw data, this whole list of insights, you, uh, you come up with categories that categorize these insights according to some categories. And then the idea, once we have these categories, we want to search for differences. Is the distribution of these insights different if you use one technique or the other? This was the basic idea. Plus, we also have video recording, interaction logs to correlate this data <coughs> with what people have been doing during, during the study. So and this is an example of what we, of what we um, obtained from, from the study. We came up with two, main, uh, uh, with two main ways to describe the insights, the findings, sorry. The first one is the temporal scope, and the second one is the geographical scope. So the temporal scope is whether the finding is related to one specific year or until or since or an interval or all time. So the scope increases. And the same thing is in the geoscope. This is something that is related to one single country, a bunch of countries, a whole continent, and so on. So an interesting result from this study is that regardless the ordering, whether people use first animation and small multiple next or first small multiple and then animation, the, we have exactly the same switch in the, in the number of findings they find in a given category, which actually suggests that given one representation or the other, the kind of finding that people tend to find is different, which has an interesting, you know, an interesting implication, which is actually if you want to design a system that needs this kind of techniques, what do you use? Do you use? What do you want to promote? What kind of findings do you want to promote? And if you want to promote both, now you have to have a technique that intersects the two things together, which is not tricky. Um, this concludes my part of evaluation. I don't know if you have any questions later 
Oh, yeah, sure. Could I ask questions about the previous slide? Yeah, sure. Um, just help me understand uh, just as far as a little bit better. Yeah. So, so the, you know, it, within, uh, let's say, interval, right, the third category under temporal, yeah. let's say, there's two bars. Yeah. Or, what do the two bars mean, top and bottom? It's round one and round two. Okay. okay. And, and this so, is the percentage of findings they had in that category? The, yeah, exactly. Okay. So you have exactly the same switch when you, you go from say, round yeah, one okay, so and you're round looking two. at the height of the bars between round one and round yeah. two, and one they always go up and the other they always yeah. go down. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then are there error bars on these numbers? Are these you know what what's the No no this is the value. This is the value. But there are I mean there are presumably each individual had a different number. Yeah. Um, yeah. how do those look, those error bars? Are these significant, these trends? They're, they appear to be repeatable, but yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Can I move on? But you see, but the, in round two, if you look at it, you've got 47% when that was followed by the thing. In the other case, the, so if you look at the talk, uh, you know, the talk, I'm, I'm trying to understand sure. why you say that the absolute numbers are not meaningful. I mean, you tell me that there's a huge difference which one you see first and then the second one? It, it makes a difference in the quantity, but not in the direction of the difference. No, trend, right? The trend is exactly the same. But the quantity is a huge difference, not just a little bit. I mean, you factor yeah, two. It's so it's clearly, you're, you're learning something from the previous visualization that's then getting confirmed on the second one. Yeah, but this so is they're not independent. You don't, you don't they forget are not what you just saw a minute ago. They are not independent, but it's, what is interesting is that regardless the order of the two, you, you experience exactly the same, the same kind of in, inversion. And, and do I see the same data set in both scenarios? If I yeah. don't want, I see the same data set. Yeah. No, I'm just maybe we can discuss. Just oh, maybe. Here. Oh, because. Okay. So you mean round two is animation? Maybe. Maybe what? Maybe the reason. I can't understand the The point is that round two here uh -huh. is animation, but right. round two here is more modern. <coughs> so you say animation is better than? No, no. There's nothing that is better here. Or, or no, not better. <laughs> no, animation better. Is produces more findings. More, animation produces more findings than of that type. Of yeah. that type. Yeah. But I would say there's something a lot more interesting here that animation, after looking at static, produces hugely better findings than uh, looking at animation first and then geography. That is absolutely this is significant. In that one case, <laughs> but only in, that's not only in that one until or, or since. It's the opposite in all time. You know yeah, for unit of or since, right. right? Yeah, in that particular. So yeah, I'm not saying that there are no additional findings, but this was the most interesting one. The fact that you have exactly the same inversion. Yeah. So the, the big question is, what is the residual learning you have in with your subjects? Since they've already got a static understanding of the geography, and now you're getting a temporal thing, because it's the same data set, it's not randomized data. No. Right? So there's a huge amount of carryover. Absolutely, but that's the point, that regardless of the carryover, even if the carryover is there, the, the effect that you observe is exactly the same. So actually it strengthens the result, the fact that there is carryover. Yeah, but that tells that the order of carryover is important. That's Absolutely. interesting. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Can you move on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, just a little bit of future uh, directions, coping with the two deadly scenes. So basically this is what I want to do. I want to uh, keep doing research on the integration of automated and visual data analysis, uh, understanding the output of data mining techniques, or using this for understanding visual algorithms, or also using image processing techniques for visualization. And uh, I also want to keep doing evaluation to understand what works, when, and possibly why, and device more robust and useful evaluation methods. 
And of course, I want this to be driven by real-world application problems, and I want to do this stuff only in an abstract uh, manner. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot. I also want to go, in terms of evaluation, I want to go into this direction of using more direct sensors to understand how people perceive visualization and how they interact with visualization. And two interesting technologies are eye tracking and brain computer interfaces, which, by the way, starts being a lot less costly than they used to be. So I think it's a very interesting direction. And a few researchers already started doing this. Um, moving first steps in this direction. Yeah, I also think, I don't, have, I don't know if I have to convince you that visual analytics as key would be a, is a very good idea, you are actually not really doing that. But what I think is, in, what I truly believe is that in a way visual analytics can help other areas of computer science and other areas of computer science can help visual analytics. So it's really like a, a very interesting collaboration and win-win situation. Acknowledgements fast, of course, this is this work is has been I've been collaborating with a lot of people. Andrada Tatu, who is one of my PhD students, Hendrik Strobel, which, who is behind my work in uh, biochemistry, Ilya Boyandino is the guy behind visual um, flow maps, Milos Kristaic around the work uh, the work uh, on um, dynamic data visualization, Professor Daniel Kain, who is my mentor currently. Professor Oliver Dolsen, who helped me with this uh, project in biochemistry. Vinny Lalan was my mentor in uh, Switzerland, and Professor Santucci was my mentor in Rome. And the old group in Constance, which is, who is, they are fun, really fantastic people, and it's always really great to discuss about visualization with them. This concludes my talk. I hope you have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
I mean, it's only fair. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hold on a second. <laughs> I mean, you guys here know, have been working with, with doctors for a long time. Do you think you can convince a doctor of doing anything automatically? Oh, yeah. I mean, they do constantly have a lot of things automatically, as long as they get the credit. <laughs> I mean, CT scan reconstruction, no doctor knows what the hell the algorithm is in there in a CT scan reconstruction. You can validate it to show, but it's... It's they they look at, and then they make a decision. Yeah, but you, no one ever visualizes to them how the algorithm is doing the reconstruction. But it no, that's, 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 another, that's, another that's another point. That's another point. But can you convince a doctor to take a decision from an algorithm saying yes or no? Oh, cancer okay. not cancer? No, and do you do you want to take on the medical malpractice insurance? <laughs> Are you crazy? <laughs> it's a good point. It's a good yeah. point. But I think both the <laughs> No no you show them I mean currently like for example the cat systems. No, I take that back. If you look at the breast cat systems. <laughs> I think that's the best example. Okay, that's the best example. They completely outperform uh, radiologists significantly. There's not a it's no more uh, thing. And the doctors are really rely on, it points out interesting aspects, really using pretty advanced machine learning, and the doctor is there just, just to as a sanity quality check, control. quality control. It's not really a huge uh, major factor in the loop. And the CAT system, it took a long time, but uh, the general mammography CAT systems are well accepted. And the CAD system in this case relies on, you know, sort of in some cases dozens of features. Oh, you. And then there are, you know, rules on top of that. The docs don't want to see all that. They, they want to. They, 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 they expect yeah. to see the outcome. So I, I kind of, I, I mean, I definitely understand, I can kind of see where your question is coming from, and I sort of agree that it's, kind of, it's tricky. It's not obvious that automatic detection is going to be widely <laughs> accepted in diagnosis. But, yeah. But it's sort of somehow the question is, yeah, that's a true, because doctor, medicine is so unique. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. It's so unique in terms of how it operates and it's a malpractice and yeah. things like this. Especially in yeah. states, as you know. Yeah. Maybe it's not the best thing. Well, no, but I mean, I think I it's don't just know. A, it's I, I can give you another example. I know these people who are analyzing their birth, birth migrations. I have doubts they can do that. I mean, they really want to see how the birds where the birds go. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, if yeah. you can see where the birds go, you cannot yeah. even start reasoning about it. Yeah, right. That's right. So I have the feeling that yeah, sure. it's needed. <laughs> um, so in the second part of your talk, you're talking about how you um, how do you evaluate these these different ways of visualizing data. Do you and you said initially you said you thought there were some issues in this and then you went and talked about some studies where you did some analysis and came with some conclusions. Yeah. And it seems that you're, you're saying here, the, the way this site is here is here are a couple of options, you tell me which one is better. Yeah. Do you think that that's the right way for this field to go, to continue proposing options and then asking people to differentiate between them, or is there some, some uh, broader strategy which can come out of this region <coughs> is going to have a more kind of a much larger impact than doing one little study at a time. It's hard. I think I think it's important to differentiate between two cases where the same technique is used, but the outcome is completely different. Let me explain. So this kind of controlled experiments have been used in the past, both for <laughs> so you have a quite complex technique, you have an alter completely alternative technique that doesn't doesn't really relate at all with the first one, and then a third technique. You compare them again in terms of errors and time. And then you have A is better than B and C. But you cannot, you cannot even tell why it is better. And I have seen quite a lot of these kind of studies. And these kind of studies, I think they are quite useless. But some other studies where the, the way you are changing the visualization technique in order to create alternatives is controlled by you. So you really want to manipulate some, some factors in your visualization and see whether they have an effect or not. In that case, you have generalizable goals if you do it properly. Do you see the difference? Um, 
I, I'm not convinced that these rules are generalized. I'll if give you an talk example. about these very specific settings. I'll give an example. The most famous experiment in, in visualization or, or charts, charting in general that we still use, we still use the result, has been, has been done by Cleveland. Cleveland. Cleveland is a statistician who worked at, I think, at Bell Labs for a long time. And he came up with very little experiments comparing, asking people to estimate a quantity on the screen, actually it was on paper, the same quantity with bars, with areas, with slopes, and so on. And he discovered that he could come up with a ranking. So length is better than area. Area is better than slope. No, actually slope is better than area, and so on. This is you, this is highly generalizable. Because now, when you have to design a visualization, you know that if you want to map dimension A to length, you want to map the most important dimension there, not the least important, right? So you can start using these results as a way to guide the way you design a visualization. So this is really, really important and generalizable. I think we have to do a lot more of this kind of evaluation. Yeah. Please. Uh, much more uh, bigger question. When you surveyed your conferences, uh, you, you did not take into account statistics. We do. No, I'm talking about statistics, the field of statistics. We do. There are well, lots of statisticians who participate to visualization. No, no, but I'm talking about statistics like this. I'm not Why? sure I understand your question. Look Sorry. at the list of your conferences. This way, like computer science conferences. And so why not go in, why have you tried mining statistical literature and seeing what visualizations they do? Sure, sure. There is, a lot, of, yeah. there is a lot of collaboration between statisticians who traditionally are trained in visualization and, visualiza and visualization people who come from computer science. Right, right, right. So, there there is a lot of so what visualizations are effective in the statistics community? There is a long tradition of visualization in statistics. Yeah, very no, long, no. Very long. Isn't that why those in that study, that study already contained over 800 papers, right? Yeah. It's with multiple years of work just to compare. Yeah. yeah. Right. I hope I answered to, to, to your question. Huh? I hope I answered to your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So actually the most fundamental results in visualization come from statisticians. This one that I just mentioned yeah, come yeah, from yeah. statisticians. Yeah. Yeah. So it's I think uh, my approach is actually leaving statistics behind and doing visualization without statistics, I think, is dangerous. That's not the case. <laughs> oh, it's not the case. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. I have a couple related questions. One, uh, how much does the diversity of people's learning styles uh, factor into uh, the results you get, which is addresses this issue of the uh, variance. Uh, and that you know, the best tool for one person might not be the best tool for another person who provides that diversity that they can choose from. A lot. A lot, but it depends also on what kind of question you have there. If it's a very low level question, which, which uh, for instance, takes into account low level uh, perceptual issues, you can almost safely uh, assume that the population is, is similar. But as soon as you start asking more complex questions, which require some kind of reasoning and background knowledge, then you have a huge value there, which is another challenge today to talk about. And the, the second part that uh, tie in with that is you know, some people are visual learners, others are auditory learners. Going back to the very earliest days of computing, uh, researchers were able to tell if your calculations were converging because by tuning the radio to the same RF frequency that your computer was, and when it started giving uh, a solid tone, they knew that their calculation would converge. Uh, by the same token, is anybody who, from your surveys uh, successfully integrating uh, auditory projections of the data in conjunction with the visual projections of the data. There was for some time something called sonification, which is the idea of using sounds to represent data. 
Because we're very good at discerning different types of bugs for a few years and then it's sort of done. One of the main problems is that it's, it's similar to using animation. Like there's yeah. a lot of studies that show animation is not great for analysis because it requires your memory. You have to remember what happened before. Oh. And I think some patients the same problem. But maybe you can pick out things quickly. You have to remember that. So maybe tests might differ if they test subjects or musicians versus people who routinely deal with visual yeah. information. Thanks so much. Take a deep breath. Welcome to the CSD. That's great. Yeah.